one of my fundamental beliefs is that you have to, if you want to solve a conflict at any level of society with your spouse and your kids, or family, the city council, nationally, internationally, the first step is to sit down face to face like we're doing and talk about it. If you can't do that, you'll never solve the problem. Well, the concept of track one and track two is rather interesting because for all those years I was focused on track one, which is government to government, which is not very risk-taking, not very imaginative, always under instructions. And so you had a fairly straight line that you had to follow. In 1985, 1985, I wrote the first book on track two diplomacy. It's non-government to non-government. It's people to people. It's small group to small group. And it is risk-taking. It is innovative. It's challenging. It does things that governments are afraid to do, don't want to do, or don't want to support. So track three is the role of business, a major factor. When they have the money, they have the skills, they have the vision, they can bring about change. But they're a hard group to sell. Track four is individual people exchanges, people coming from one culture to this culture, for example, learning new skills and going back and imply, carrying out those skills in their own country. Track five is what we do as a small institute, a small non-governmental organization, not-for-profit here in Roslyn, Virginia. It's education, training, a little research. Track six is peace activism, it's people power. It's the power of people collectively to change systems non-violently. Track seven is religion. Wherever we go, we work with people of different religions. Track eight is money. I should tell you, we're always broke. Uh, that's the way the field works. It's hard to raise money for peace these days in the United States. We don't charge for our services overseas, so we have to raise money to go overseas and do the work that we do. And all of our work, basically, is internationally overseas. Track nine is the center circle in our logo, which is communication, which is what we're doing right now. That's the heart of this whole concept, this is communication, the ability of people to talk to each other. Our first project uh, was in Cyprus, which is an interesting case in itself. Uh, we started in 1992. Now, Cyprus was uh, a part of the British Empire until 1960 when it was suddenly declared a free and independent nation as the British Empire was collapsing. And for four years, they had peace on this lovely island in the eastern Mediterranean. And then there was an attempted at coup. Greeks got a little greedy and wanted to take over the island. Didn't work the coup, but there was a lot of killing or ethnic cleansing, as they called it in those days. And the UN Security Council met and put in a peacekeeping force uh, just a few months later, 1964. Ten years later, 1974, there was another attempt at coup. This time, Turkey sent them 35,000 troops, a lot more killing. And all the Muslims moved to the north, and all the Christians moved to the south, totally separate from each other when they'd been living together for a thousand years in peace. You couldn't cross the green line, which the UN set up, which has divided the capital city of Nicosia in half. You couldn't send a letter, you couldn't make a phone call. Totally isolated one side of the island from the other in 1974. We were invited there in 1992. Total stalemate between 1974 and 1992. No action whatsoever took place. And the, some of the people who asked us to come in were frustrated by this stalemate. Well, we only go where the people in the conflict invite us to come and see if we can help them. So that's a pretty basic issue. It's the people that we work with. So we got invited to Cyprus. We got permission from the UN to go to the other side. We went back and forth. We went for three weeks and just listened. Something that governments don't know how to do. And we asked people what their needs were. How could we as a small NGO help them? We didn't have money, but we had some skills. And they decided that they'd like very much for us to 
carry out some trainings in the field of conflict resolution to help break this stalemate that they were faced with all those decades. And so we decided to take on the project. Whenever we take on a project, we make a five-year commitment to that project. It's not a weekend, not a month. It's five years or longer if they want. And actually, we worked for eight years in Cyprus. Oh. So we took on the project. And then we went and we called on four Track 1 entities. We called on Mr. Denktosh, the Prime Minister in the Turkish Muslim North. We called on Mr. Kalaridis, the Prime Minister in the South. We called on the State Department, Washington, and on the island, the ambassador. We called on the UN in New York and on the island, the peacekeepers. And we said the same thing to all four of these Track 1 groups. We said, we've been invited on your beautiful island by all of those tracks uh, that make up the community to try to see if we can be of help providing conflict resolution training. And so we wanted you to know about it. And we invite you as track one to participate in every one of those trainings that we would hope to hold. We didn't ask for their permission, but we wanted them to know about it. Well, they were still a little puzzled about who we were and what we were all about. So I said, I believe that every conflict in the world can be resolved. There's no such thing as an intractable conflict. It takes time, it takes skill, it takes a little money, it takes patience. But eventually, you are going to sign a peace treaty on this island of yours. And when you do that, all the Turkish soldiers will go home, and all the UN peacekeepers will go back to where they've come from. And you'll have peace on this beautiful island for three weeks. And then someone who doesn't want peace will create an act of violence. They'll kill somebody or blow something up. And by that time, we will have trained a critical mass of people from all of these tracks on this island of yours. And some of them will have connections in that village where that act of violence took place or that community. And they will go there and they will contain the conflict that's their goal, to contain the conflict so it doesn't spread across the island. So our goal is to break the cycle of conflict. To break the cycle of conflict. If you can do that, then you can begin to build a peace process. Well, somehow they seem to understand and uh, they didn't seem to object. So we worked separately for 15 months with the Muslims in the North separate from the Christians in the South. And then we brought six people from each side together on the Green Line at the Lidra Palace Hotel. Six Christians and six Muslims. They were political leaders, a university president, a businessman, a lawyer, a journalist, a poetess. They'd never met before, but because they trusted us, and that's what's critical in this whole business, and they had the skills they bonded within an hour, and they became our steering committee. And over the next eight years, we trained 2,500 Cypriots together. That's a lot of people. And then we ran out of money, and we left the island. Well, three years ago, suddenly the deputy prime minister of the Turkish Muslim North declared to the world, I'm opening the gates on the Green Line. I want the people to move back and forth as they used to do. I want them to get to know the other side. I want them to visit where they used to live. I want to change the whole dynamics of this island. He raised the gates and within the first 24 hours, 5,000 people went back and forth across that ground, both sides back and forth. 5,000 in 24 hours. Nobody was shot, nobody was killed, nobody was hurt. The people that we had trained on both sides told their friends, it's okay, you know, it's okay to go across that line. Don't, don't worry about it. Within the next three months, 700,000 people crossed that green line. There are only a million people on the island. <laughs> Who raised the gates? One of those six Muslim that we <laughs> brought together after 15 months on the island and working together. We worked with him for years. Ten years later, he had the power to raise the gates, and he changed the dynamics of the island 
peacefully, mm -hmm. and now we have peace on Cyprus. I'll tell you one little story that uh, appealed to me, uh, the power of this. We, we always sit in a circle. We sit in a circle for four reasons. First is that it's practical, everybody can see everybody else and hear everybody else. And the second reason, it's a symbol of peace building in every civilization on demand if you go back far enough in their history. The elders will sit around in a circle, sometimes a fire in the middle, sometimes there's not. But it's been a symbol of peace building for thousands of years. The third reason is that it allows the energy to flow across the circle without impediments, but chairs and desks and that sort of thing. Energy is important to me because you can begin to sense what the people on the other side of that circle are thinking about. And the last reason is it's a symbol of our institute, the circle, which I described a few moments ago. So we were, we let it be known that we were going to be uh, holding a training in the, in the Turkish Muslim North. <laughs> but we don't advertise. <laughs> We don't put up signs, we don't go on the radio or television and say we're meeting at this particular place. <coughs> we work by word of mouth. Mm. Word of mouth is the way you build trust. If you and I get together and you trust me, the next time we meet you can bring a friend. It's a slow process, but it's a process that lasts. When people come together, they stay together. So there were 35 people in this circle. 40% were women, which is great, because for me, it's the women who are the peace builders in the world, and you can appreciate that. It's the women who are the peace builders. They always get it before the men do. So I was delighted to have 40% of the Muslim population in this 35-person circle to be women. So we went around the circle, and each person, I just wanted to know their first name and, and why they'd come together. We don't probe, you know, we just take people at their own face value. Halfway across the circle where you're sitting from me, a man spoke up when we got to him and he said, I'm a medical doctor. He said, I've hated the Greek Cypriots all my life because they killed both my parents. And he said, but I want to tell you a story about what happened to me. It's good. When I went on with my education, after my parents died, I became a medical doctor. I'm married, and I have a 10-year-old son. And the other evening, I went to kiss him goodnight and found lying in bed next to him was a long toy wooden rifle that he'd taken to bed with him. I said to my 10-year-old, why do you have that wooden rifle in bed with you? And the boy said, to kill the Greek Cypriots when they come after me. And the doctor said, I learned a powerful lesson then, and I'm here to say, I forgive the Greek Cypriots who killed my parents. I want to learn new skills to pass on to my son. It's the kind of impact you can have. In 2004, we got friends from the U.S. Peace Institute here in Washington, D.C., and a private donor. And we brought together, for the first time in history, 20 Kashmiris in Nepal, in Kathmandu, right to the north. 10 from Pakistan Kashmir, 10 from Indian Kashmir. Eight of the 20 were women. Very important. And they had a week together. And it was great. They had never met together before. They were all private citizens, civil society, leaders in their respective communities who wanted to come together with the other side of the first time in 50 years. I remember we went separately with the two groups and we brought them together. I mean, after dinner, uh, we were sitting together and one of the Pakistani men said to the Indian side, you know, I'm really fed up with this line of control which was put in in 1964, which we can't cross. My sister lives in Jammu and the Indian side it's only about 30 miles from my home in Pakistan. I haven't seen my sister in 40 years. But one of the Indian women spoke up and she said, I live in Jammu. Where does your sister live? And he told her. And she said, that's only 10 minutes from my house. 
She said, you write your sister a letter. We'll take some pictures together. And when I get back home, I'll go see your sister and tell her what a great guy you are. <laughs> well, his heart melted on the spot, as you can tell. And so they bonded in that time together. We got more money from the same sources last year. And we held a second uh, workshop in the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean. 27 people this time, many from the first group, 14 from Pakistan, 13 from India. By this time, things had improved, and they wanted to do a press release, communication skills out there. And so we had a journalist from each side. They drafted a press release. Everybody agreed to it. And that's the first public action, because it was printed in newspapers all across both countries, about Kashmiris coming together. So that was a great step forward. But the most significant thing that we've done in that area, and we've been working in Kashmir now for 10 years to show you how long it takes to build the kind of trust relationships we're talking about. I made a speech on April 7, 2000, in Musafirabad on the Pakistan side. A refugee camp, in pretty grim conditions. Uh, and I reminded them that the year before, 1999, it had been a politician's bus. The Prime Minister of India took a bus from Delhi to Lahore and met with the Prime Minister of Pakistan, and they issued the Lahore Declaration, focusing on Kashmir, which was great, but then fell apart for other reasons later. Well, every one of those thousand people in the refugee camp remember that. I said, I want to start a people's bus, not a politician's bus, a people's bus. So the people from both sides of the border can move back and forth for the first time in their lives peacefully and visit their relatives on the other side and so forth. Well, they thought it was a great idea. So I came back to Washington and began to push governments and the embassies and the press in the region. Whenever I go back, I'd make a speech about the people's bus. And finally, what had to happen did happen. This idea from track two had to move into track one, because only track one had the power to raise the gates on that line of control. In September 2003, the Indian government made four track two suggestions, and they used track two, so that makes my ego feel pretty good, because the word, the concept had gotten out to the subcontinent. The two, four track two proposals, the third one was a people's bus. And they've taken the language, the idea, totally, and said, let's do this to Pakistan. And four days later, Pakistan said yes. Well, I thought, well, great, that's going to happen, you know, in a month or so. Well, it, it didn't. The diplomats on both sides argued for a year about documents, under any passports, visas, whatever. Finally, in December of 2004, the President of Pakistan, the Prime Minister of India, ordered the diplomats to agree. And so on February 15, 2005, they publicly announced the People's Bus would take place on April 7, 2005, five years of the day after I'd made that proposition. And it did take place. Okay. Prime Minister of India and Sonia Gandhi, the head of the Congress Party, flew up to Srinagar and waved goodbye to the bus. It was the number one sign of peace building in the subcontinent since 1947. On April the 8th, the next day, on the front page of the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, was a beautiful picture of 20 Kashmiris from Pakistan crossing the rebuilt and renamed Peace Bridge to go into the Indian side. So a major symbol of peace building Track one, taking it over from track two and making it actually happen. That's exciting. Liberia, country in West Africa, founded 150 years ago by freed American slaves that dominated the country and the indigenous people for all those decades. In 1980, a man named Sergeant Doe, the military, Pulled off a coup, he killed the whole cabinet and the president took over, and he ran the country for 10 years. And then he was in turn assassinated and killed in another coup, and the whole country 
fell into total chaos. Down to the tribal level, everybody killing everybody else. It was, it was horrible. The Carter Center in 1992 <coughs> set up a, a center in Monrovia, the capital. <coughs> and they invited us a year or two later <coughs> to help them <coughs> in the area of conflict resolution and the training. And so we went there and we eventually identified nine people that we wanted to work with. And there were nine of those nine. Seven were men, two were women, seven Christian, two Muslims. They were about at the number three level, the warlords, the deputy warlord, and then number three. And there was no safe space <coughs> in Liberia, no safe haven. And so we took everybody to Ghana, a <coughs> country nearby. And we went to a lovely place up in the north called Akasambo. And we had 10 days together with those nine people. We were a four person team. It's a very interesting group. One of them was even a colonel in the, in the military. And <coughs> we sat in that circle <coughs> when the colonel asked if he could give a prayer to get started. I was delighted. And he did uh, <coughs> in English. The very next day, one of the two Muslims said, could we do a prayer in Arabic? And we said, of course, and they did. But that sort of set the tone. But those nine people gathered together, <coughs> and we took a half a day for each of them to tell their story. Now, of course, wherever we go, there's fear. Everybody is afraid of everybody else. And that was certainly true in this circle. And they were all afraid of each other. And that actually became a bond over time. But each one of them felt that they were the most traumatized person in the country. But by the time they heard the other stories, they realized that all of them were equally traumatized by the conflict. And that too became a bond. And they had these joint terrible experiences that they had shared together over time. And while we did the trainings that we were talking about and they began to interrelate with each other, the next to the last day, I proposed a new idea. I said, I'd like you as a group to project 25 years into the future. 25 years. What would you like your country to look like in 25 years? Well, that's difficult for anybody to do, but particularly if you worry about whether you're going to survive in a week or two after you get back to your country. <coughs> but I said, I'm not going to put anything write him on the walls or on the blackboards. I just want to listen to you as you talk about your vision for the future. And I will write down what I hear. And I'll summarize it and I'll give it back to you tomorrow morning. We spent the whole day on that very simple exercise. And they got really into it, really involved. And each one of those nine people participated. And I took notes and that night I wrote it up. The next morning I gave it back to them. They didn't change a sentence or a paragraph or a word. It's only half a page. <laughs> they all had a common vision. All these tribes that have been killing each other for whatever reason had a common vision of the future of their country. They wanted democracy. They wanted peace. They wanted education. They wanted jobs. They wanted freedom of the press, freedom of religion, all the things that we believe in in this country. They had this common vision, which was so simply stated that that's what they all agreed to. So I said, this was fantastic. This was great. Now I wanted them to come back to today's world. And could they agree on one step toward that goal by the end of the day, the last day we were together? <coughs> they thought they could. So they worked together. And that finally they came back and announced with pride they had agreed on two steps. The first step was to go back to Monrovia and create their own non-governmental organization on peace and conflict resolution. All nine of them working together for peace, which was great. The second step, they said, we have identified 21 leaders in our conflict, the warlords, the UN, uh, ECOMOG, ECOWAS, the key embassies, 21 different people. And we've agreed that all nine of us together will meet over the next month 
nine to one in each of those 21 different meetings. Mm -hmm. We want these people, these leaders, to see physically that we can all work together to build peace. And that's what they did. My greatest advice to leaders and practitioners of multi-track diplomacy is to remember the most basic principle of living systems, which is that everything is interconnected. And that means everything. That means conflict is connected to climate, to population, to the economy, to energy, to uh, social development. Everything is interconnected. And our greatest problems in the world are where there have been the most dire disconnections where we have separated ourselves from one another as peoples, from the natural world, uh, th from these different sectors, one from another. That's where the problem is. So it's easy to identify the disconnections. What do we do about it? The action imperative is very simple. Reconnect those places where there has been the disconnect. Separation is the greatest disease facing humanity in this time and building bridges across those lines of separation, finding unity, finding community, finding ways to cooperate, collaborate, and remember that there is only one of us on this, on and with this planet. That's our work in these times. Well, I'm often asked uh, how I transform from track one to track two. <laughs> because I was a lawyer, I was a district attorney, I learned win-lose, I win and you lose. And how do you get to win-win? Well, it took a very long time, uh, but I finally uh, achieved that, of that goal. Uh, and I think the most dramatic example of that was a major world conference. I, I worked for many years on United Nations affairs. Uh, in 1964, in Geneva, there was a conference on trade and development. They called it UNCTAD-1. And there were about 2,500 delegates there. I was not there. And they, the developing world, forced through 50 resolutions, which the West voted against, because uh, they didn't like them. I was in my first world conference in 1968 in New Delhi, India, where it was called UNCTAD-2. The same 2,500 people were there, first item on the agenda was, what did the West do about those resolutions? Well, the West got up and said, we didn't do anything about them because a resolution in the UN system is only a recommendation for national action. We voted against them. We had no reason whatsoever to carry them out. Well, this was a total shock, a learning experience for the rest of the world. They realized that what you had to do if you wanted to make progress was build consensus win-win. And so there were another 50 resolutions adopted by that conference, but 48 of them were negotiated. And they were adopted by consensus. The other two were voted on, they knew nothing would happen. So the West went back home morally bound to try to do something about what they'd agreed to. And that was the first mass learning experience of the power of consensus, the power of win-win. And that's what I've been able to transfer in my life uh, since that particular point in time. The only way you make progress in the world is to build consensus. And the only way to do that, as I said earlier, to sit down face to face and talk about it. That's critical to resolving conflict at every level of society. <laughs>